church in the next world and its connection with the church militant. Doctrine of Catholics on this matter. Hitherto we have considered the church only in her terrestrial being and essence, and her supermundane part remains still to be described. The faithful who, summoned away from hence, have quitted their visible communion with us and have passed into another state of existence, do not, so the Catholic Church teaches, thereby sever the bonds of connection with us. On the contrary, holy love, which was transferred from a higher order of existence to this lower world, perpetually enfolds in her sacred bands all those whom she hath once held in her embraces, provided only they have not willfully torn themselves from her. And amid the dissolution of all earthly energies, still retains her eternal power. All now who, with the hallow of love, have departed hence, as also those higher created spiritual beings, who, though they never lived with us in the relations of space and time, yet like us stand under the same head, Christ Jesus, and are sanctified in the same Holy Spirit, form together one church, one great and closely united confederacy with us. But not all believers who have been members of this terrestrial church and have departed from it with the sign of the covenant of love enter immediately on their passage into eternity into those relations of bliss destined from the beginning for those who love God in Christ. According as they quit this earthly life, either slightly touched by divine love or by it effectually freed from the stains of sin, they pass into different forms of a new existence. The former are transferred to a state suited to the still defective moral and religious life of their souls and which is destined to bring them to perfection. The latter, to a state of happiness corresponding to their consummate sanctification. The first, like the members of the church terrestrial, are with reason included in the suffering church, for their peculiar existence must be considered as one not only still passing through the fire of purification, but is also subjected to punishment. For it depended only on themselves by the right use of their free will during their earthly career to have established themselves in a perfect, intimate and untroubled union with God. Those, however, admitted into the ranks of happy spirits form together with these the church triumphant a denomination which sufficiently explains itself. That the doctrine of an ulterior state of purification, of a purgatory in fine, is involved in the Catholic dogma of justification and is absolutely inseparable from the same, we have already in a former part of this work demonstrated. We shall accordingly speak here only of the peculiar mode of communion which is kept up between us and the poor souls that are delivered over to the cleansing fire. We are taught and are even urged by the strongest impulse of our hearts to put up for them to God and Jesus Christ our most earnest supplications. We present to God, more especially, the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross and beseech him that for his son's sake he would look down with graciousness and compassion upon our suffering brothers and sisters and deign to quicken their passage into eternal rest. This custom, which we cannot absolutely abandon, for we are impelled to its, ex ex we are impelled to its exercise by all the power of faith and of love, is not only confirmed by the usages of the most ancient nations and of the chosen people of God in particular, but may be proved to have been authorised by the practice of the primitive church. 
and is accordingly revered by us as an apostolic tradition. But moreover, as to the mode of punishment and the place which purgatory occupies, the Church teaches nothing further, for she has on this point received no special revelation, and when we use the expression purifying fire, we employ it only in the usual figurative sense. Of a different kind is the intercourse subsisting between us and the triumphant Church. Let us turn our view more particularly to those of its members who were once incorporated with the Church on earth. Not only do they work among us by the sacred energies which, during their earthly pilgrimage they displayed, and whereby they extended Christ's kingdom, God's kingdom, and founded it more deeply in the hearts of men, energies whose influence, acting at first on those within their immediate sphere, spread thence ever wider and wider, and will extend to all future times. Not only are they permanent models of Christian life, in whom the Saviour hath stamped his own image, in whom he, in a thousand ways, reflects himself, and in whom, exhibiting to us patterns for all the relations of life, he brings vividly before our view the whole compass of virtues rendered possible through him. But they also minister for us, such is our firm and confident belief, in a still more exalted degree. And this their ministration requires from us a corresponding conduct. The purer their love and the fuller their share in that ineffable bliss whereof they have become partakers in Christ, the more they turn their affections towards us. And amid all our efforts and struggles, remain by no means passive spectators. They supplicate, supplicate God in behalf of their brethren, and we in turn, conscious that the prayer of the righteous man availeth much with God, implore their intercession. The act whereby we do this is called invocation, invocatio, and that wherein they correspond to this call is termed intercession, intercessio. The setting up of the saints by the Church as patterns for religious and moral imitation, connected with the doctrine of their intercession in our behalf with God, and of the corresponding invocation of their aid on our parts, constitutes the principle of the veneration of saints, which is in the same way related to the supreme worship as the mutual relation existing between creatures is to the state of dependence of them all on their common Creator and Lord. Virtuous creatures look with love and reverence on those of their body who are eminently endowed by God, and in virtue of their love, implanted within them, they wish each other all good and lift up their hands in each other's behalf unto God who, rejoicing in the love that emanates from himself and binds his creatures together, hears their mutual supplications in case they be worthy of his favour, and out of the fullness of his power satisfies them. And this no creature is able to accomplish. Moreover, if we are to worship Christ, we are forced to venerate his saints. Their brightness is not else than an irradiation from the glory of Christ and a proof of his infinite power, who out of dust and sin is able to raise up eternal spirits of light. He who, therefore, revereth the saints, glorifieth Christ, from whose power they have sprung, and whose true divinity they attest. Hence the festivals of the Lord whereby the commemoration of the most important events in the Redeemer's history is, in the course of the year, with the most living solemnity renewed, the Church hath encircled with the feasts of the saints, who, through the whole progress, progressive history of the Church, testify the fruitful effects of the coming of the Son of God into this world, of his ministry and his sufferings, his resurrection and the outpouring of the Spirit, 
so that accordingly in the lives of the saints the effects of the life of christ and its undeniable fruits are brought home at once to our contemplation and to our feelings and with reason may we say that as god is no god of the dead but of the living so christ is no god of a generation tarrying in the sleep of death but of a people truly awakened in the spirit and growing up to sanctification and to bliss lastly it is to be borne in mind that the doctrine of the church does not declare that the saints must but only that they can be invoked since the council of trent in the passage we have cited says only that it is useful and salutary to invoke with confidence the intercession of the saints of faith in the divinity of christ and his mediatorial office or in his sanctifying grace and the like the church by no means teaches that it is merely useful and salutary but that it is absolutely necessary to salvation doctrine of protestants on this subject to these principles of the catholic church protestants oppose but mere empty negations and a dead criticism in the first place as regards purgatory luther at the outset denied this doctrine uh, denied this doctrine as little as that of prayers for the dead but as soon as he obtained a clear apprehension of his own theory of justification he recognized the necessity of giving way here likewise to the spirit of negation in the small called articles composed by him he expresses himself in the strongest manner against the doctrine of purgatory and characterizes it as a diabolical invention calvin also with the most furious violence declares against this dogma and the symbolical writings of his party coincide with him on this subject at the same time with the clearest conviction they avow the motive which incited them on to this violent opposition and disguise not the feeling that the adoption or even the toleration of the doctrine of purgatory in their religious system would admit a principle destructive to the whole reconciliation and forgiveness of sins they allege is to be sought for only in the blood of christ it would be therefore a denial of his merits and of the rights of faith which alone saveth if it were to be maintained that the believer in the other world had still to endure punishment and were not unconditionally to be admitted into heaven the misconceptions which these assertions betray have been already pointed out elsewhere as regards the kingdom of saints made perfect and our relation to them the lutheran opinions on this matter stand in the closest connection with their doctrine on the church and are only a transfer of their maxims respecting the ecclesiastical communion of believers in this world to that of the next they deny not the communion of believers in the church militant but they reject the conditions under which it can become real living and effectual the believers indeed stand all in a spiritual communion between each other but we know not why the whole doth not govern the individual there is no mutual action between both so that the member can well dispense with the body the idea of communion remains completely idle powerless and ineffective in the same manner they question not the existence of a communion existing between us and the saints but they rest satisfied with the bare representation of it a representation devoid of all truth because it either hath no reality or at best but an imperfect one the angels must be devils and the saints wicked demons if they can only be conceived to be in a state of cold stiff indifference towards us and their love of god would be idle in, it, in itself did it not extend to rational creatures equally susceptible of love and were not active in our behalf 
It was this idea which partly induced the German reformers not to offer a direct opposition to the Catholic doctrine. In the first place, they concede that the lives of the saints are worthy of imitation, and that they should be honoured by our imitation. They even deny not, deny not that the saints pray for the church at large, but they assert that the saints must not be prayed to for their intercession. The reason which they adduce is the same that brought about the dissolution of the ecclesiastical communion, namely, that Christ is our only mediator. We must, however, examine the coherency of these ideas. It is indeed passing strange that the saints should pray to God for us without apprehending that they encroach on the mediatorial office of Christ. And God and Christ should even permit these, their functions in our behalf, and accordingly find them free from all presumption. And yet, that we on our parts should not beseech the exercise of these kindly offices, because our prayer would involve an offence, whereas the thing prayed for involves none. But the prayers of the saints must surely be termed culpable if our requests for such prayers be culpable. But should their supplications in our behalf be laudable and pleasing unto God, wherefore should not the prayer for such supplications be so likewise? Accordingly, the consciousness of their active intercession necessarily determines an affirmation of the same on our part and excites a joy which, when we analyse it, already includes the interior wish and prayer for these their active aids. For all communion is mutual, and to the exertions of one side, the counter-exertions of the other must correspond, and vice versa. Certus, our indifference for the intercession of the saints would annihilate the same and completely destroy all communion existing between the two forms of the one church. But if it be impossible for us to be indifferent on this matter, then the doctrine of the Catholic Church remains unshaken. The intercession of the saints, as well as the corresponding invocation of that intercession on our part, is so far from impairing the merits of Christ that it is merely an effect of the same, a fruit of his all-atoning power, that again united heaven and earth. This our ecclesiastical prayers very beautifully and strikingly express, as they all without exception, even such wherein we petition the, the benign influence of the celestial inhabitants on our earthly pilgrimage, are addressed in the Redeemer's name. Moreover, if the intercession of the saints interfere with the mediatorial office of Christ, then must all intercession and, and prayer for intercession, even among the living, be absolutely rejected. It should be borne in mind that Catholics say of no saint, he has died for us, he hath purchased for us redemption in his blood, and has sent down the Holy Spirit. But by communion with Christ, all glorified through him, partake as well in his righteousness as in all things connected therewith. And hence the power of their intercession, hence also the right of petitioning for that intercession from the living, as well as from the departed just. The opinions which, according to Calvin's examples, his disciples in France and their remonstrance in Holland have formed in this matter, have the merit of entire consistency. They declare the idea of an intercession of saints for mortals to be an absolute imposture and delusion of Satan, since thereby the right manner of praying is prevented, and the saints know nothing of us, and are even quite unconcerned as to all that passes under the sun. From this point of view in which it is imagined that the saints resemble the gods of the Epicureans and live joyous and contented in heaven, without being in the least concerned about our insignificant actions, or suffering themselves to be thereby disturbed in their enjoyments, the prohibition to solicit the suffrage of the saints is alone tenable. 
such an idea of blessed spirits as only the most obtuse selfishness could imagine possess certainly nothing to invite to a friendly intercourse with them and god forbid that in heaven a felicity should be reserved for us to which the condition of any earthly being in whose breast the spark of a loving sensibility is yet alive would be infinitely to be preferred <laughs>